good morning. Can we give the band a hand? Thank you guys so much. Seriously, I was just standing over there and listening to all of your voices singing together. And there is something just so powerful about responding to that sacred mystery that the high king of heaven was born low to save us. That's not my teaching this morning. That one was free, okay? So my name is Bradley. I'm on staff here at Orchard. And uh, whether you're joining us online or in the room this morning, it is so good to be together. So I know it was just Thanksgiving, and some of us are super not ready for this. It's still November, but ready or not, it's Advent, everyone. This is the first week of Advent, this season in the Christian calendar that encompasses the four weeks leading up to Christmas. A couple weeks ago when we got our first weird actual snow of the year, my three-year-old son Rowan, he looked out the window and he turned to my wife Alex and he said, Mommy, it's snowing. That means it's Christmas. He then said that he had been waiting for, quote, a yawn, yawn time, which made it kind of sad when Alex had to tell him that he would have to wait just a little while longer. In fact, Advent is characterized by this act of waiting waiting for God to come to earth in the form of Jesus. So as we walk through Advent together, we're gonna highlight a few of the stories of people directly involved in the coming of the Messiah, the people who are actually waiting for the birth of Jesus. And we actually wanna share some of their acts of worship that are recorded in the gospels. These are known as some of the very first Christmas songs, and they've been adapted and sung as part of church services around the world for centuries. We wanna use these songs of Advent to talk about worship in a broad sense. We believe that these acts of worship actually have a lot to teach us about what it means to live a life of worship because worship is the corporate music that we engage with on Sunday mornings. And it's also far more than that. Worship is the offering of all that we know of ourselves to God. Now, when we talk about worship in this broad sense, it can be easy to think of it in terms of like our duty to God or in terms of religious performance, but God actually wants something better for us. Worship is not about religious performance. It's about relationship. So to live a life of worship is to live a life fully engaged in relationship with God. So this morning, I'm excited. I get to share an act of worship that was written and declared by who I think, someone who I think was actually one of the first Christians, one of the first followers of Jesus, his own mother. This gives new meaning to the phrase, my mom thinks I'm special, but we're not going to go there quite yet, okay? Instead, I want to take you on a journey. It's Christmas time in the year 2011. I am 19 years old. Stop doing the math to figure out how old or young I am right now. And I find myself at Mayo Clinic with my family. Now, if you haven't been to Mayo Clinic, there's something you should know. Mayo is a hospital, but it is not just a hospital. Y'all, this is the Ritz-Carlton of hospitals. I'm talking vaulted ceilings, massive atriums, water features, live tropical plants, and at this time, everything was decorated for Christmas. They went all out. You ever seen a ficus with a star on top? I hadn't either. I hadn't either. So I'm walking with my family through Mayo Clinic, and as we pass through one of the main lobbies... There's a woman playing this gorgeous grand piano, Von Marr style, okay? My family and I stop to listen for a minute. And when she finishes the song she's playing, things get a little weird. She points at me. I've never seen this woman before. She points at me and she goes, you! So have you ever been caught off guard by something? (laughs) And then before you know it, you're asking yourself, how did I get here? Or why have I allowed this to happen? Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you signed up for the gift wrapping team at Christmas in Walnut and all of a sudden found yourself doing a cartwheel in in a big room full of people. So she points at me and she says, you, what's your favorite Christmas song? And out of pure anxious reflex, I yell back, have yourself a merry little Christmas. And then she says, do you sing? And before I have time to even think about how I was gonna lie and say that I had never sung before, but I would love to hear a rousing instrumental version of the song, my mother, yeah, She thinks I'm very special. She decides to butt in with all of the glowing, humiliating pride that only a mother is capable of. She says, oh yes, he does. And before I know it, this woman has played through the intro and is looking at me with a face that says, all right, Sonny, it's go time. And at that moment, I had a few choices. The most obvious one would have been to run away to another atrium and hide behind a sculpture or a plant. Or I could have acted like an adult and just politely declined. But instead, I looked around at the people I was with, 
at my mom's hopeful smile, and I thought, fine. <laughs> so I went ahead and I sang these words. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. From now on, our troubles will be out of sight. And as I sang those words, I realized that they weren't true. Those words weren't true for the couple who had just sent their child in for surgery. They weren't true for the man who stopped wheeling his IV through the lobby so that he could stand and listen. They weren't true for many of the people walking through Mayo Clinic that day, and they also weren't true for me. I was there because a month before I received a cancer diagnosis that turned my world upside down. So many of us, we were in that hospital with heavy hearts, not light ones. Our troubles weren't out of sight. For many of us, trouble was all there was to see. In fact, even as I sang, I couldn't help but think that this whole thing, the decorations, the music, it all felt a little hollow, a little dishonest, maybe even a little disrespectful in light of our current reality. Anyone else walking into the Advent season feeling that way? In fact, we know that many of you are no strangers to the massive atriums of Mayo Clinic. So maybe this year finds you navigating your own health issues and you're unsure about what the future holds. Maybe this is your first year celebrating the Advent season without a loved one. Maybe financial strain on your family has turned into relational strain on your marriage. Maybe you're feeling overwhelmed by the brokenness in the world, the poverty, the war, the injustice. Or maybe for you, this season full of holidays has amplified how lonely you already feel. Y'all, when we observe Advent here in the 21st century, we're not waiting for the literal birth of Jesus like the people we read about in scripture, but we do a whole lot of waiting, don't we? Jesus may have been born a long time ago, but we are still waiting for every wrong thing to be made right. We're still waiting for the day when there's no sickness, no pain, no war, no depression, no death. We're still waiting for God's kingdom to be made real here on earth. And yet, Throughout all of the scriptures, there's something that the people who worship God are both characterized by and instructed to do again and again. Rejoice. Even in our waiting, we are actually called to worship God by experiencing joy. Paul says in, in his letter to the first century church in Philippi, he says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Rejoice. And Paul wrote those words while he was in prison. And in the Old Testament, God tells us through the prophet Nehemiah that the joy of the Lord actually is our strength. And he said that to a nation of people weeping about how broken they had become. Y'all, do you feel the tension there? How can we be urged to rejoice when our circumstances seem hopeless? How on earth am I supposed to let my heart be light when my heart feels heavy? And if the joy of the Lord is my strength, how can I ever be strong? As we wait for God's goodness to be made real here in this broken world, what does it mean to worship God, to live a life fully engaged in relationship with God through joy? Many of us here in Western Christianity we have been wrongfully taught that we can either grieve what is broken or we can celebrate God's goodness, but we can't do both. So some of us, in an effort to choose joy, we, we turn our backs on the pain of the world or the pain in our own hearts and lives, and we focus only on that which we can celebrate. So we try to bright side every broken situation for ourselves and often for the people around us, and in the process, we actually trade the deep and abiding joy of God for forced man-made happiness. And honestly, we have valid reasons for this. Maybe we were taught that holding it all together is actually what it looks like to honor God or to care well for the people around us. Or maybe we're just afraid of what would happen if we allowed ourselves to grieve. 
But that's not our only tendency, is it? For some of us, our effort to be honest about the brokenness of the world and in our own hearts leaves no room for joy. So we silence it. We silence our own joy and often we silence the joy of others and we trade it instead for cynicism. We put up our defenses and we keep our eyes open for the darkness that must be all around us. And there are valid reasons for this too. Maybe we do it because we don't want to overlook the people in the world who are hurting or we do it because we've been hurt. Maybe we've come to think, if I don't expect anything good, at least I won't be disappointed. But the truth is that God wants something better for all of us. So today, this morning, if you walked in this room, or if you're joining online feeling exhausted from the pressure of holding it all together, if you're feeling overwhelmed by the brokenness in the world and in your own life, or if you're just feeling lonely, like no one really knows what you're going through or cares what you're going through, first of all, you need to know that God sees you right now. God understands you perfectly. God loves you more than you will ever be able to understand. And God's right here. God is with us this morning. And God has some hope for us. See, it's to a weary world. There it is. Sorry, I lost my page, everybody. God has some hope for us. It's a weary world, everyone, that has a reason to rejoice because it is in the midst of a weary world that Jesus, fully human and fully God, came to offer us the real strength-inducing joy that we so desperately need. Okay, so this morning we're going to look together at Luke chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 46. This is where we find Mary's song. So toward the beginning of Luke's gospel, Mary is probably a young teenager. She's engaged to be married, and she has an encounter with an angel named Gabriel, all in a day's work, just a few things. Gabriel tells us that Mary has found favor with God, that she will give birth to a son, and that she should give him a common name at the time, the name Yeshua. We pronounce it Jesus. Yeshua means God saves, God delivers, God liberates. The angel goes on to tell Mary that her son Jesus will be called the son of God, that he will reign over God's people forever and not to worry about the whole biology piece of things because Jesus would be born of the Holy Spirit. And catch this, he also tells her that her relative Elizabeth, who was very old, everybody thought that she would never be able to have children. Gabriel tells her that Elizabeth is pregnant because nothing is impossible with God. Now, that's a lot of information for anyone, right? But Mary, this young girl with more courage than I could even begin to understand, does possibly the most remarkable thing in all of human history. She says, yes. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you've said about me come true. Mary's saying, okay, God, I will carry and give birth to this savior. I'm risking my honor, my reputation, my relationships, and my life to become pregnant outside of marriage. I'm risking everything to carry this baby that is not mine, to give birth to a son who will liberate the very people who will probably scorn me. But even so, even so, I will make room, God, for what you are doing. And then Luke tells us that Mary hurries to go see her relative Elizabeth, which hurry is kind of a funny word because it probably took her four days to travel from her home in Nazareth to Elizabeth's home in Judea. And I don't know about you, but to me, four days of travel is plenty of time to have just a good and proper thought spiral for Mary to ask all of the questions like, how did I get here? Or why have I allowed this to happen? Or maybe more appropriately, what's going to happen to me? But the moment she enters Elizabeth's home, Luke tells us that Elizabeth's baby leaps in her womb. And Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and she encourages Mary that this is real, that she is the mother of the Most High and that she is blessed because she trusted God enough to say yes. And that's where we find Mary's song, okay? Starting Luke chapter one, verse 46. Mary responds, 
my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He's performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Now, it's too easy for us to imagine Mary as this middle-aged white woman with folded hands and like a serene facial expression and forget what's really happening. Those words were spoken by a teenager who just learned that she is pregnant outside of wedlock in a culture where it would have been perfectly legal for her to be executed. But even so, listen to how Mary begins her song. She says, my soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior. Y'all, that word rejoices actually means jumps for joy. My spirit jumps for joy. And she goes on to say that God is doing a great thing in her life. She declares God's power and mercy. And then she zooms out to talk about what God's doing in the world. And do you hear what she's saying? God has scattered the proud. God has brought rulers down from their thrones. God has sent the rich away empty. Y'all, this isn't the quiet, serene Mary that we see in stained glass windows or nativity scenes. This is a strong, brazen, courageous woman who is bursting for good news for every weary, broken, and hungry soul. Everything is about to change, she's saying, because God has never abandoned us and God is good and God is here. So yes, Mary's current reality is complicated. Y'all, it's dark. It has more room for questions than answers. But even so, Mary has made room for the real, authentic, strength-inducing joy of God. That's a joy that this morning we are gonna call even so joy. Even so, joy is a deep and abiding sense of well-being that is not dependent on our present circumstances. Even so, joy acknowledges the darkness, but it claims the light, and it's often found with and through the people who are already around us. Even so, joy strengthens us. It opens our eyes to God's kindness and power and presence in every situation, and it leads us toward a life that is fully engaged in relationship with God. Even so, joy leads us to a life of worship. And what I'm learning is that even so, joy doesn't just happen. It requires practice. So as we continue to worship God together this Advent, I want to share a few practices that we can learn from Mary's story. So as we make room for even so joy, we are invited, number one, to acknowledge the darkness. Acknowledge the darkness. One of the central themes of Mary's song is this acknowledgement of the broken power structures of her time. The hungry and the rich. The rulers who sit on their thrones while others live humbly. And she also acknowledges the brokenness of her own situation. She uses this Greek word that translates to humble, lowly, humiliated, and depressed in spirit. But in the same breath, she says that God has been mindful, that God has seen her, God has noticed her, and God has cared for her. Y'all, when we turn a blind eye to the brokenness that exists in the world or to our own pain and disappointment and weariness, we can easily trick ourselves into thinking that God turns a blind eye too. When all the while, God sees us, God is mindful, and God is inviting us, even pleading with us, to acknowledge the darkness and to bring it to him. In the book Champagne for the Soul, which is all about joy, 
the author Mike Mason puts it this way. He says, there can be no real happiness without a full range of all other human emotions accompanying it. A rich, authentic humanity is the soil out of which joy grows. Our real, honest humanity, it's the soil where joy grows. For some, this Advent is our invitation to bring our honest, weary selves to God and say the words that God already knows. God, I am not okay. Y'all, God's not afraid of your honesty. He sees you. God cares for you. God is for you. That truth is fertile soil for deep, abiding, even so, joy. We can acknowledge the darkness. And Mary's story also invites us to lean on others. In Mary's conversation with Gabriel, he purposefully called her attention to her cousin Elizabeth. And then God used Elizabeth to give Mary the confidence that she needed. Mary would actually go on to stay at Elizabeth's house for three months. And I can only imagine that Elizabeth became someone who would continuously remind her that, yes, there is plenty for her to be fearful of. But even so, God was with her. God was carrying her through. So who has God placed in your life for the purpose of pointing you toward a deep, strength-inducing, even so, joy? Y'all, this is one of the reasons that we gather together. It's why we're here. It's why we pray together. It's why we lift our voices in worship together. There's nothing magical about a building, but there is something profoundly spiritual about choosing to be with one another. The Holy Spirit uses this time together to build us up, to help us lean into the hope and the faith of the people that we meet, like Mary did with Elizabeth. And also it gives us opportunities to be like Elizabeth, to become encouragers. We were created to lean on each other. So as we practice acknowledging the darkness and leaning on each other, making room for even so joy also invites us to claim the light. Claim the light. Even as Mary acknowledges the darkness in her song, she boldly declares the goodness of God. And the result is this clear-eyed view of reality that ultimately points to a God that is mindful and merciful and mighty. A God who is not idle, but active in this world. Mary is claiming the light. And I can't help but wonder if she's actually preaching to herself reminding her own soul of the truth that she is going to need as she walks forward. So how do we practice claiming the light in the midst of these darker, shorter days, in the midst of troubling news and our own weariness and worry and pain? One way is by recognizing the gifts in our life, no matter how small they are, and allowing them to point us toward God's unwavering goodness. So a cup of hot coffee in the morning, or several cups of hot coffee in the morning, no judgment, okay? It reminds us that God provides us what we need. A good book reminds us that God encourages us to rest. A finished home project reminds us that God can do more with our work than we can do ourselves. And a loud, messy family gathering full of screaming toddlers and kids who only eat mashed potatoes and at least one awkward and or heated political discussion, and hopefully a healthy serving of laughter reminds us that we can love and be loved just as we are. Maybe last week, the blue sky, after several cold and cloudy days, reminded us that things are always moving, that darkness is always temporary, that the sun will shine again. These pockets of joy often look like small snapshots of everyday life. But even if that's what they are, it's not all they are. These small pockets of joy are holy moments. They provide windows for us to see the greater work that God is doing in this world. They're opportunities to claim the light. And I want to speak for a second to the person who can't seem to find even one small moment of joy. This can become all of us in different seasons of our lives. So if this morning, if you truly feel like darkness is the only thing that you can see, first of all, I am sorry. You're not alone. 
And we would love to walk with you through this season of your life. And also, claiming the light for you might look like finding just one small truth that you are able to say right now. In my life, that one small truth has been and it continues to be that no matter what, if all else fails, God is with me right now in my current moment. Your truth could even take the form of an even so sentence. So take a look at this next slide. You can fill in the blank yourself, but it might sound like, I feel completely overwhelmed, but even so, God is with me right now. Y'all, speaking something that is true, even when we don't feel it, it can be a powerful way for us to claim the light. It can give us strength. It can stir up even so joy. That's kind of what happened for me that day at Mayo Clinic. I'll invite the band up when you're ready. As I sang that from now on, our troubles will be out of sight. The words didn't feel true. I hadn't forgotten where I was, but singing those words allowed me to become present to the idea that maybe one day I wouldn't have cancer anymore. Maybe I was gonna be okay. This truth would become more real in the months that followed, but then it was just a moment of light, a tiny infusion of even so joy that I desperately needed. The Advent season, it's about waiting, but we don't have to wait until everything is made right to celebrate the glimpses of God's kingdom that's already coming in this world. And as we do that, as we acknowledge the darkness and lean on each other and claim the light, we make room in our hearts for a deep, strengthening, even so joy that is rooted in reality. It's not dependent on our circumstances and it strengthens us in our innermost being. It helps us to live lives fully engaged in relationship with God. And that is what it means to worship. So let's pray together. God, this morning, I'm so grateful for that truth in the song we sang earlier, that the high king of heaven was born low to save us. God, that you don't leave us to the complexities of this world, but you are with us. God, I thank you that in whatever season we're in right now, that promise is true. God, you are with us right now. So Father, would you help us as we go through this Advent season to acknowledge the darkness and bring it to you, to lean on one another for strength and to claim the light, to be on the lookout for these glimpses of heaven that you are already bringing to earth. And now God, would you help us to claim the light by singing together? Because God, you are with us, you are for us. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.